It took them a long time to find you, I said to the near catatonic girl who was hugging her knees as she perched on the metal slab. The girl didn't respond. Her lips were cracked and dry, and her blonde hair matted and disheveled. Occasionally, she made a noise something like a whimper. I need to ask you some questions. Can you nod if you understand, please? She locked eyes with me, slowly lifting her head to reveal a gaunt, sullen face. It made sense. If she was who the Foundation thought she was, then she had spent almost three weeks wandering the Saharan desert. She maintained eye contact for a short time before nodding solemnly, struggling to support the weight of her own head with her slender neck. The effects of starvation were prominent and ghastly. What were you doing in the desert? I began. Uh, tour, she rasped after a few moments. I swallowed the urge to comment on just how bad she looked as I turned over the photograph on the table in front of me. It showed a healthy, smiling blonde girl on holiday with her friends. When the agents extracted the young woman in front of me from the desert, they were fairly certain that she was the missing tourist, but couldn't make a positive identification due to her poor physical condition. Is your name Allison Manning? She nodded again as a slow tear crept down her cheek. The moisture highlighted her burnt and peeling skin. It was the type of sunburn that was going to need medical attention although I'm sure that was the last ailment on the Foundation medics' lists as they checked her over at the point of extraction. Allison Manning had last been seen on a guided camel tour of the Egyptian portion of the Sahara Desert. Her friend said she wandered off to find somewhere to relieve herself and was never seen again. The Foundation had a difficult time keeping Egyptian authorities away from the highly publicized situation. Multiple operatives were sent out to the desert on a high-risk mission, posing as search and rescue officers sent by the American Embassy. ID Card, the Foundation's Information, Detraction, Censorship, and Rescission Division, worked overtime to minimize the chance of the public becoming aware of the anomaly we accredited Allison's disappearance to, SCP-3062, a dangerous and poorly understood Keter-class object. I had been sent to interview and assess the victim. I know you left the group to try and find a place to urinate. Why didn't you return? The girl took a while to respond. She removed her arms from her knees and stretched her legs out, maneuvering herself into a seated position on the slab. It was as if she were struggling to remember back that far, despite only 20 days having passed. Finally, she opened her mouth to speak. The boy, he needed help. I gulped. Her words confirmed what we already knew, but hearing of sightings of SCP-3062 always made me shudder. I couldn't begin to imagine what horrors Allison had witnessed in her time wandering. 3062 often appeared first as a young Egyptian boy in his early 20s. Other victims had also reported him being in some distress. I'd interviewed a few of them, but none who had been out there with the object for as long as Allison Manning. For her to have survived for that length of time made her something of an anomaly herself. Why didn't you go back to your group to get help? I... I don't know. Nothing made sense, she replied, tears now rolling freely. He spoke English. He told me he had a camp nearby and could call his family from there, but he'd hurt his ankle and couldn't walk to it. I told him I was with the group and... He said the tour went by his camp, but he knew a shortcut. He said they'd catch up with me there. I know I shouldn't have gone. It wasn't my first time traveling. I knew it was stupid. But something about him was so magnetic. Did you make it to the camp? No. There was no camp, she responded, shaking as she spoke. So what happened? We kept walking. He just kept reassuring me we weren't far. After a few hours, all I could see was sand for miles. I was so thirsty. She reached into the briefcase I carried everywhere and handed her a bottle of water. She'd inhaled the entire thing in seconds. And the photograph? I turned over another picture on the table that had lay face down next to the one of her before her disappearance. It was sent from her phone to a friend's 18 hours after she went missing. The girl got up, struggling on her scrawny legs. 
Through her torn vest top, you could see the front outline of her ribs. I never knew if that scent. I lost my phone after that, she said as she edged closer before finally gasping as she looked at the image. No, she wailed. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. She continued to repeat those three words as her body tensed and she stamped her feet on the floor in frustration. The image showed the very tip of her foot and nothing else but sand. What did you think you captured in this photo? I asked clearly, cutting through her distressing chanting. I knew that a common phenomena reported by those who had survived contact with SCP-3062 was seeing sources of water or signs that help was nearby. The anomaly liked to taunt its victims. Why, however, is a question the Foundation is still asking. The girl took a few deep breaths and steadied her hands. I don't know how long it had been, but when it started to get dark and cold, the boy was gone. It was like I turned my back for a few seconds and he teleported away while I wasn't looking. He just wasn't there anymore. I kept walking. I had to. It was so cold. I wasn't dressed to be out there for long. I thought for sure I was going to die that night. And I thought for sure I could hear that damn boy laughing at me in the wind. But I survived. The sun rose as just as my ankles were ready to snap, I saw the spring. A spring. Fresh water. In the middle of the desert. I cleared my throat, making it clear to her that I needed to interject. You'd been through quite the trauma. It's not uncommon for people's minds to play tricks on them alone outside. This was real, she spat firmly, with the most energy she displayed the entire time. I drank from it. I drank from it for ages. Then I noticed the sign, wooden with Egyptian writing on it. People had been out there. I took my phone out to try and call for help. I'd checked it so many times before but had no single, but this time there was a bar. Only one, but it was there. It was enough to dial out, so I took a picture of the spring and sent it to Jody. I thought they could locate me from it. I pushed the almost blank, sandy photograph towards her. She sniffed back tears and looked at me with anger in her eyes. I wasn't hallucinating. Not that. I drank from it. And that's how I survived for a few days. I stayed there, waiting. I shivered as night fell and sweated in the blistering heat of the day. No one came, did they? I pitied the girl. SCP-3062 was so cruel. He'd manifested an entire facade of their being hoped for. He'd given her just enough to keep her alive. I believe sheer willpower and object-induced delusion kept Allison going in those weeks. They did. Jody came. Three dark nights passed and Jody came. I didn't notice her arrive, but I knew by that point it was unlikely she were any more than a figment of my desperate imagination. You knew she wasn't real? Correct. But the boy was. The boy came back? I asked, trying to stifle the audible shock in my voice. It was unusual for the apparition of the boy to return to a victim of SCP-3062 once it had moved on to the stage where it was manifesting loved ones and simulating rescue scenarios for its unfortunate prey. The object could bend reality, making it omnipresent and rendering its human-like form unnecessary once it had isolated its victim. It preferred to taunt, and taunting was personal. He never left. I could hear him all the time at first, but I just tried to block it out. Once Jody left again, I started to see him. You were out there for 20 days. What happened? How long was he with you? How did you survive? Behind her deep sunburn, the girl turned pale. I was overwhelming her with questions, but I had to know what she'd seen. Her insights could have proven far more valuable than the other victims I'd interviewed. Her eyes welled with tears once more, and she came closer to the table I sat at. It couldn't have been that long. I was counting the sunrises. There were only six. She screeched, so close my ears rang as her deafening tone hit them. 
As I said before, you've been through a trauma. All of this is normal. What you saw was just your mind's version of self-preservation. It's a normal human response. Lies, Lies. she interrupted, Lies. bellowing so her voice echoed in the remote, hidden room in the Foundation's Egyptian outpost. I was thrown into turmoil as I realized what I had to do. SCP-3062 was an object that the Foundation had been unable to contain in the traditional sense. We worked hard on recovery, ensuring that missing individuals in the Sahara are tracked swiftly and with as little publicity as possible. But in all honesty, it was more damage control than prevention. Some victims were easily convinced of their own madness, a result of their disorientation in the wilderness. But others, like Allison Manning, knew there was more to what they'd seen. Those victims had to be subjected to amnestics. I didn't like administering amnestics. Removing a part of someone's memory often felt wrong. But as I looked at the disturbed girl, I decided that on this occasion, it was probably the kindest option. I reached into my briefcase to pull out the amnestic device, but Allison's anger was growing. She walked towards me and started to wail, drawing my attention as I continued to rifle through the bag. What is this place anyway? You aren't the police or search and rescue. What was that boy? My breathing grew quicker and I started to work quickly, realizing Allison had just become a high risk of leaking information about 3602 to the general public if I didn't act quickly. I carried on searching, but couldn't find the device I was looking for. She carried on, getting closer. Although she was slender and fragile looking, there was something intimidating about the unbridled anger in her eyes. As she approached me, she became savage, outstretching her arms to attack. I watched as the pupils of her eyes grew so large they overtook the iris. No one had been in 3602's presence as long as she had, and the results were fascinating. My heart sunk, and I felt my own eyes begin to glaze with tears as I realized there was only one solution to her imminent attack. Without research, any kinder methods would have risked my safety and the security of the Foundation so I drew my gun from its leg holster and shot her. As blood poured from the wound in her forehead and she collapsed to the floor, her eyes returned to normal and I watched as the light faded from them. Just before she took her final wheezing breath, an expression came over her face and her entire being began to morph into something else. There was barely a transition and the vision only lasted a few seconds before returning to that of the dead girl. But for a moment, in Allison's place, was a young Egyptian boy. SCP-3062